Hello everyone, I hope you're doing very well. Today we're doing the buyer's guide for the F86F Sabre in DCS World. To keep this uniform so that we can make it comparable to other modules in DCS World, we're going to follow our standard practice. One, we're going to look at the capability of the aircraft. We're going to look at the weapons, the sensors, and the navigation. Two, we're going to look at the visual effects. How good is the visual effects of the cockpit? How good are the visual effects of the outside model? We're going to rate that between one and five so that we can compare it to other modules in DCS World. There will be a master document linked in the video description of this video where you can see all of the aircraft that I reviewed and you can compare them. And as well as that, you will get the other GR members. You'll be able to see their ratings too so you can see a whole consensus. Be aware that from time to time I may change the rating I've given this aircraft. I will not update the video, but I will change to the master document. So consider that the master document. Three, sound effects. How good are the sound effects inside and how good are the exterior sound effects? Rated one to five. Four, interactivity and detail. Rated one to five again. How interactive is the cockpit? How many switches are modeled? When I do those switches, how does it feel? How is the detail systems behind those switches? When I interact with the cockpit, does everything do as it should do? And so on. Five, flight model. Not necessarily how accurate is the flight model to the real aircraft, because none of us playing DCS will ever have flown an F-86. And DCS being DCS, we just expect it to be accurate. What I'm more interested in is how does the model feel to me? How immersive is it? How does it convince me that I'm flying a real F-86 Sabre? Are there any weird things in the flight model that make me think that I'm not in a real plane, that make me think I'm in a video game? And so on. Rated 1 to 5 again. Difficulty. Rated 1 to 5. Again, 1 is easy to learn and pick up. 5 is very difficult to learn and pick up. 1 and 5 are neither good nor bad. They're just a guide for you so you know what you're buying. And finally, history. Since this aircraft has been out, which is what, three and a half years, something along those lines, has it had a troubled history with lots of bugs like some of the aircraft or has it been good, reliable with few bugs? It's something that I think people deserve to know. So let's get in the cockpit. Okay, welcome to the F-86F cockpit. This was the premier fighter in the early 50s for the United States. It's a subsonic fighter. It has a maximum theoretical speed of 0.92, although you can push slightly past that, but much past that and you start getting nasty Mach effects and loss of control to an extent. So it's important to keep under Mach 0.92. In terms of weapons, it's a pretty simple loadout. For the guns, we've got six times 50 cal machine guns in the nose cowling. I think they're M2 machine guns, but I stand to be corrected. And they are relatively effective. That will be considered the main armament in the early 50s. Additionally, on our pylons 5 and 6, we can have air-to-air -air Lao 7 or GAR 8 Sidewinder. So these are essentially the, the first or one of the first types of Sidewinders that went into service. They're IR guided. However, you've got to remember that this is the very beginning of guided air-to-air -air missiles and compared to today's air-to-air -to -air missiles these are absolutely terrible they are useful against a non-maneuvering bomber or any non-maneuvering air target or a very slightly maneuvering target but in a dogfight or something like that where we're doing vicious turns they are absolutely useless so they are period accurate and you have to work around that if we go out to pylons what is that four and seven we've got bombs in this thing we do have light ground attack Ability, we have an ANM64, it's a 500 pound bomb, conventional bomb, and a Mike 117, that's a 750 pound or thereabouts conventional bomb. We also have, they're under pods for some reason, but these are, I believe, smoke rockets, a single smoke rocket on this pylon. Or we can have uh, high explosive rockets, the HVARs, and that is two rockets on that pylon. And then if we go out for pylons three, two, and one, we can have the smoke rocket or two more high explosive rockets. Again, smoke and two explosive rockets and out to pylon one. We've got fuel tank of 120 or 200 gallons. We can have one on either side and the same rockets there. And I think we missed on pylons four and seven. We can also have fuel tanks there of 120 gallons. So not the biggest array of weapons, but again, that's what we will get for the period. And it's nice to see that it does have some ground attack ability. Now, as for the actual deployment of these weapons, it's actually a really impressive aircraft. Bearing in mind, again, we're designed in the late 40s, operated in the early 50s. 
We've got some really cool features on this aircraft. And now, none of them are particularly easy to use as compared to a modern fighter, but you know, that's just what we get with uh, historically accurate aircraft. So the guns, we can essentially aim the guns in three different ways. We do have a, like an aiming pipper here. We don't see it when we're on the ground. And we can fire it manually. So with the guns more or less, uh, with the pipper more or less uh, fixed to the longitudinal axis of our aircraft, or we can use gyro assistance. We can uncage the gyro. It's a gyro driven gun sight, and that will help compensate for any lead, at least as determined by the movement of our aircraft, not by the hostile aircraft. And for ranging, we could use a radar. We've got radar on this aircraft. It's just used for target acquisition and ranging. We can see we've got a little uh, uh, gauge here showing the range to the uh, targets that selected and that will give us very basic ballistic calculations we can use for the guns or a third way is we could use the gyro uncaged with a manual ranging option we would actually turn the throttle like that to manually range using visual means including setting the wingspan of an aircraft here in feet and that's how we could range manually. Now that sounds all sounds pretty awesome. In reality, it's very hard. This, this is the pioneering technology of the early 50s. It's very hard to actually do all that. Almost all of the time in DCS, I would just use pure, I'll have it cage, and I'll just use pure, you know, my own skill, if you like, to fire. I won't use this stuff. And the reason I'll usually aim manually is because the radar and the manual ranging and the gyro is all great until you start maneuvering the aircraft and then it becomes inaccurate and you can actually damage your gyro. So it was only really designed for shooting down bombers and whatnot or very lightly maneuvering aircraft. Again, in a dogfight, this whole gyro and radar range system starts to break down. And again, that's period accurate. And for deploying the uh, GAR-8 missiles, it's a very simple system of they are going to be essentially bore-sided. Their sensor is bore-sided to the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. So we'll simply maneuver our aircraft so that a hostile aircraft goes in front of that sensor area and then we'll get a tone from the missile if it's got a positive track on that IR contrast and then press the button and hopefully they'll guide. Like I said, if they're relatively heavily maneuvering aircraft, then the GAR-8 missiles are pretty much useless. Next is the rockets and this is generally pretty clever and advanced even for some of the you know 1960s aircraft in that we will have a, uh, a pipper here and we will turn our gyro on once we've come in for a attack will be stabilized we'll be able to turn our gyro on because we'll no longer be maneuvering and we will actually track the area in front of our aircraft with the radar in terms of tracking the ground and we'll actually have a radar slash gyro driven gun sight if you like pipper here to aim and fire the rockets and it's pretty cool again it's limited technology it's not perfect but it's a lot better than just doing it by eye You'd finish your run with the rockets, you'd pull out and then you'd turn your gyro off as not to damage it when you're pulling G's and making turns. As for bombs, uh, it's even better. We've got excellent support for bombs. Again, it's very limited by the technology of the day, but if you appreciate the period technology, it's actually really interesting stuff. So we can go in on a bomb run, we can uh, put ourselves down at a certain pre-designated dive angle. When we're stable, we would un-gyro. Our, our gun sight again we would use our raid radar ranging here to range the target on the ground and again we'd have a kind of semi-automatic pipper system where we just hold the pipper over the target by moving our aircraft and drop the bombs at a pre-designated distance it's actually really cool not the most accurate thing in the world but it's really cool it's what i call a kind of early periodic predecessor to like a ccip type bombing that we'd get in modern aircraft like harriers uh, Hornets, F-16s and so on. If you didn't want to do that then we've got other ways of bombing as well. We've got manual MPC, manual pipper control bombing. This is again really interesting, not amazingly accurate but for the period and the day quite cool. We have different pages here that we can use. They tell us to enter at different speeds from a dive and at different altitudes and then we would say uh, 20,000 feet above the target, AGL, and enter in at 270 knots and then we would set our dive angle to 50 degrees and we would actually dive down to 50 degrees and that tell us, tells us to release the bombs at whatever that is 4500 feet using this uh, barometric type altimeter and that's a manual way that we can do it using barometric pressure and lookup tables here 
to get bombs on target. It's not easy, it's really hard, it takes loads of training, but the amount of satisfaction you can get by doing that kind of thing, if you're into that kind of thing, is uh, it's massive, really cool stuff. And then there's a third way of doing bombing called labs. That's I think it's low altitude bombing system. Now I believe this was actually originally designed for dropping nuclear bombs. Uh, we actually had the ability to take nukes. Not and this is a system that allows us to, I've got tutorials on all of this stuff by the way, if you wanna go and look at it. Go in very low level, below the first SA2 uh, and SA1 SAM systems. And we would pull up vertically above our target the bomb would actually be released automatically when we were pulling up almost 90 degrees up in the air. The bomb would then go up and then slowly start to fall down back on its target and boom, your nuclear bomb goes off. By which time, after it's completed its parabola and drop, we've got several miles away so that we're not killed by the blast. And you can do it with conventional bombs, obviously. We don't have nukes in this, but we can do it with conventional bombs. Really hard, really challenging, takes loads of training, but again, massively rewarding. And if you're into kind of history like me, then this stuff is just pretty much unbeatable. Again, all of this stuff, you can see how it modified its way through the decades into the modern aiming systems that you take for granted. If you just go out and buy your F-18C Hornet and it basically it essentially drives itself, you've got you know a tiny bit of work you have to do to go and bomb these targets. Well, if you come back and have a, a plane like this, you can see where all of that technology came from and how it had to be perfected and modified through the years with uh, analog and digital computation. So sorry for taking so long about that stuff but I'm really trying to show you how no it's not the most effective plane in the world in DCS yes it's really hard to go out and bomb stuff accurately but in terms of historical importance uh, I think it's really absolutely top-notch and I highly recommend it so that's the weapons in terms of sensors well there's not really anything there's a basic ranging radar um, I can't think of anything else that we could really call a sensor in the true terms of what I mean in terms of navigation well to be honest uh, almost nothing we've got a basic ADF automatic direction finding set this allows us to tune in to NDBs in the upper kilohertz and lower very lower megahertz range NDB would usually be uh, you know a beacon at the end of a runway so it allow you to at best to find a uh, friendly runway whether in good or bad weather no ILS, no TACAN back in these days, no kind of tactical navigation at all. So all navigation, apart from finding your way roughly to a runway, or, you know, to a runway, is going to be your map and looking at things on the ground. Uh, that's just how it is. Okay, next we're going to look at the graphics. Now this, I think it's what, about three years old. It's mid or early 2016, so three, three and a half years old now. And it's starting to show its age in terms of graphics. It was never the best graphics cockpit, certainly. If we start looking down here, if you compare that to something like the inside of a F-18 or an F-14, obviously this is almost starting to look a bit kind of arcadey. Best thing is, I mean, graphics, whether you like graphics or not, is relative subjective. So the best thing I'm going to do is just um, look around and you guys can determine for yourself. That way you don't have to buy the module just to find out whether it looks good or bad. Gun sight, it looks okay. The textures don't really have much depth compared to what we're used to now on the, um, you know, on the modern, on the modern aircraft. By which I mean F-18, uh, F-14, and whatnot. It all looks a bit plasticky and just a bit not real now doesn't it it looks a bit starting to look a bit gamey everything here is fully functional obviously needless to say joysticks looking a bit gamey isn't Shadows and everything work pretty well. ADF set looks pretty good. Okay, that's inside. Let's go and have a look outside.
so outside it actually I mean I really like the mesh outside the textures they're not perfect they're not up with the the top daddies of the F-18 or whatnot but they're okay I'll say outside is probably a three and a half inside it's just it's okay it's just getting a bit dated it's about the same quality look as a Flaming Cliffs 3 plane or something along those lines I guess so I'm gonna have to put it down as a two in here so for an average of graphics that's what 2.75 I think that's maybe a little bit cruel. Let's say, let's say an average of three for this aircraft for graphics. Next, we're going to look at the sounds, the sounds inside the cockpit and the sounds outside. So it's very important that we can hear what the engine is doing through the whole range of the revs. Although it's a bit whiny and a bit nasally and a bit nerdy, I mean it sounds good. You can tell exactly what the engine's doing at any time, and it's really important as a virtual you know, pilot we can't feel vibrations and things, so we need the sounds to tell us exactly what that engine is doing. So it does sound a bit wussy, but the information's there that we want. Let's go and have a look outside. pretty good outside pretty happy with it to be honest I've never really had like I said it's a bit nasally and whiny in here but outside it's always been good and I've never really had a problem with the sound of this aircraft so let's go and take off and see what we can get and the point it's important we have ground rumble we have some kind of ground rumble when we're uh, on on the ground because again we can't feel with our with our bones when we're touching the ground and you can already hear a bit of ground rumble it's a bit loud but it's fine So as soon as we take off, we should see that ground rumble disappear. Yep, yeah, it's perfect. Got our, whoops, put our gear up. Put our flaps up. You can see our Amy Pippa there. Next thing is, I want to check that we get uh, wind sound. I want to be able to tell how fast I'm going, not by looking down at my gauges here. But I want to be able to tell by the sound of the wind. So I'm going to scroll forward and see if we get some good wind sound. Yeah, and you can hear that. You can hear that wind sound in the background there. I can get a good idea of how fast I'm going without worrying about my instruments. Sorry if it's a bit loud, but I've turned it up on purpose, obviously. Got some gunnery sounds while we're here. It's okay, it's not perfect, but probably what it would sound like, I imagine. And you can see the aircraft shakes. Got a bit of shake there. Next thing I want to test is when I go into high G maneuvers and high alpha maneuvers, I want the, I need to get the sound effects to tell me that the I am A at high G and I'm B at a high alpha. I want to hear that the airframe's under stress and starting to struggle. I want to hear whoosh sounds. I need that to tell me as a virtual pilot who can't feel the G-force, who can't feel the alpha, who can't feel the shaking. I want to feel, I want to hear that. I need it to, to be told to me. So you can see the alpha down at the bottom, you can see the G. You can already hear the pilot starting to struggle. So we can tell the G by what the pilot's doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to step up the, um, the stress on the airframe now, step up the alpha. You can hear there, you can hear the aircraft really starting to struggle in terms of alpha if the airfoil breaks down. Let's do that again. And this stuff is really important. In a dogfight, you can't look at your instruments and you don't have this fancy instrument bar at the bottom. You are completely reliant on your sound as a virtual pilot to tell you exactly what the airframe is doing. 
So this stuff is not just, um, you know, it's not just fancy extras. It's stuff that you have to have as a pilot, as a virtual pilot, sorry. A real pilot doesn't have to worry about this. A real pilot can feel all of this stuff through his body. Just let the speed build up. It's just easier to uh, stress the plane out when we're going faster. greatest this is really good i wish the other aircraft would take the cues for the blacking out from this aircraft it's the best aircraft for blacking out in that it's progressive and everything just feels good about it it's actually oh my god it's actually mm, it's a bad example but let's go through that again in fact we'll talk about the blacking out in the flight model it's not really uh, relevant to sounds i just want sorry well sorry to be pedantic i just want to really i can't hear that stress on the airplane that i want to hear There it is, you can hear it when I'm, when I'm bunny hopping, look. You hear that? It's there, but you've really got to, you've really got to work to get it. Uh, but at least it is there. So, but that's, uh, that's not too bad. In terms of weapon deployment, everything is there, I think. You know, you've got, obviously you've got the gun sounds. It's important we have weapons deployment sounds and DCS modules because we can't feel the bombs and stuff dropping. So you need a good gajunk when the bomb drops. You need a psh when the rocket fires and everything like that. And from memory, I'm pretty sure everything's there uh, to a usable extent. So that's all okay. Let's have a little look at uh, flybys and whatnot. Low power flyby. High power flyby. This sounds fine. Everything just sounds. It sounds fine. It's all there, to be honest. It's. I don't think it's to everyone's taste. Like I said, the engine's a bit whiny. It gets on people's nerves. But you know, it probably is how an engine like this uh, uh, sounded. And everything that I want to hear is there. Uh, a lot of that is missing or kind of hidden up in some modules or hidden, you know, hidden by other sounds where everything's pretty much there and it's all balanced just about right. The amount, the level of the outside sound sounds about right to the level of the inside sound and so on. So in terms of a score, I don't think I can give it um, a five because it hasn't got, simply hasn't got a good enough sound engine to compete with the big modules like the brand new F-18 and stuff like that. But um, I think we're going to give it a solid four out of five for sound. Now, while we're airborne, we might as well look at the flight model. And it's, it's really good. It's, it's one that I've always been really happy with. I've never had any complaints about the way it handles. First of all, in terms of its uh, interaction with the ground, it's fine. It, it feels planted on the ground, doesn't feel unrealistic and doesn't feel non-immersive and that's another thing I should say like kind of like I said at the beginning I'm not looking for necessarily how well it it, it imitates the real saber I'm I'm expecting it as a default position to imitate the real saber I'm really looking for how immersive it is how it feels does it make me feel like I'm in a real aircraft or does it make me feel like I'm playing a video game and I want to feel the weight of the aircraft I want to feel the momentum I want to feel the inertia all those basic physics things that you don't really need to think about you just know as a human being if you drive a car you know what it feels like um, and, and an aircraft, you've got a good idea in your bones of what it should feel like. And this is pretty much there. I mean, the roll is actually amazing. Bearing in mind we've got swept back wings. And swept back wings like this with a swept back trailing edge, they, they historically roll really badly. But this thing rolls almost too well. But, you know, I'm sure they've got it right. Uh, this was made by ED and very rarely do the ED modules falter in any way. They're usually the best generally in the way they handle. They're not usually the best looking, but they, they usually handle the best in terms of their... Uh, the realisticness of flight model, their immersiveness as flight model. Uh, one thing I was uh, touching on earlier when I crashed was that the G, the way the G mounts and is simulated is excellent. It's the best model for this. Watch this. I'm going to mount the G up. Look how slowly, A, it's just the way it feels, 
how slowly I can control that G. It's not aggressive. I've got a real complaint with modern planes like the Vigan, the F-18. You just black out so easily. It's incredibly frustrating. It's not fair on a virtual pilot to be expected to be able to avoid G that well. Bearing in mind that we can't feel the G. And we have got time to look down at our bloody G gauge. We need a good progressive G effect like we've got here that allows us to avoid G reasonably. And this is exactly how it should be, this one. Look, watch this. I can balance it perfectly. It's got, and you can hear that cool kind of sound effect they have. Most of them, most of the modules don't have this sound effect. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to. Uh, let me just get my speed back up. Let's try that again. Seven G, eight G. I can balance it right there on six and a half G. Whatever else, can't remember if this guy gets a G suit or not. Look at that. And you can't do that in many of the modules, some of the FC3 planes you do. And as virtual pilots, we absolutely have to have that for the reasons I stated earlier. So it's turn, it's roll, it's climb, just about everything here. It feels good, it feels immersive, it feels... It doesn't feel heavy, but it's not a heavy plane. It's just a, you know, it's just a few tons. Uh, if I load it up with bombs, I can feel the weight of those bombs. I can feel the drag of those bombs, I can feel an asymmetric loadout, I, feel, I can feel a wing pulling down if I've got a one on one wing good and reasonably, there's no fly by wire I'm not even sure there's a, a stability system in here it's um, it's, it's just um, good old fashioned connections to the uh, control surfaces so let's, um, let's try and take it to its limit Roll over, power back on, rather left. Whee, there we go. Everything like that feels good. Very easy aircraft to stall. Excellent stall recovery, very easy to recover. It's a relatively stable aircraft. To be honest, it's one of these aircraft, it hasn't got any fly by wire to get in the way, like the F 18 or the Mirage. And it's one of those aircraft, a bit like a uh, one of the warbirds, like a Spitfire, where it is just fun to get in the air and just do loops and stuff. A lot of the aircraft is just not that fun because, like I said, you just don't have direct control of it. Something like this, I could sit here and do this all day. Feels good. The effects allow me to enjoy it. Keep it well away from the edge. You know what I mean? Really cool stuff. Anyway, don't want to waste any more time on that. So in terms of a score, because this plane has never annoyed me, plenty of the other aircraft uh, flight models have annoyed me for various reasons, there are glitches and stuff that I've not liked. This, I can't really find anything I don't like about the flight model. So we're gonna rate it a solid four out of 10, uh, sorry, four out of five. Uh, it's not up there with the absolute best, but um, a good solid four out of five. All right, so let's go in for a landing. Next is interactivity and detail. So what we're looking at here is the level at which we can interact with the cockpit, the switches and knobs we can turn, how many of them work, how many of them do what they're supposed to do, how many of them are they're not bothered programming, and, and that kind of thing. And the detail behind these systems. Now, this is fairly hard, hard aircraft to judge. There's not that many systems in it. There's no MFDs, there's no real radar. No, it's got a ranging radar, but... You know, no acquisition radar, no track radar, nothing like that. It's just knobs, dials, buttons, and very simple stuff. So it's an ED module or Bell Simtech or whatever they call themselves these days. And historically, they're good, very detailed. They're not very lazy. So I expect to see good things. You see circuit breakers down here. Everything's doable. Whether that they're actually modeled is probably unlikely, but it's, it's down there. I mean, I can't even read what they are. Um rocket count uh, I mean I'm not going to go through everything here but I just want to give you a general idea that everything is switchable and you hear those sounds those sounds are important to me because someone sat there and you know worked out sound for these buttons and I want that if I'm going to pay my 50 60 70 dollars whatever these things cost nowadays we won't talk about prices because they will vary over the years and you know, I want someone to have bothered doing all this I don't want cheapskate hear that Everything there, everything works there, everything works here. Every, hear that? It's quiet, but you can even hear these little clickies. Mm. 
<laughs> Dickhead. Oh dear, I think I've upset the flight model, finally. How about that for modelling? Not bad, eh? Uh, oh god, alright, Jesus Christ. You know, everything's here, everything's here. I mean, I've, I've had a good tutorial se series I did on this, and everything here works. Everything here works properly, everything is modelled. Uh, oh look, something that's not modelled. It is the Jettison Supplement Stores, Supplementary Stores. That doesn't work. There you go. Look, look, it doesn't work. Oh, it does, you have to take the thing off. <laughs> alright, I stand corrected. Uh, everything down here works from memory. I can't even remember what all this half of stuff does now. Oh my god, what have I done now? What have I done now? Oh, I put the emergency uh, 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 thingy release. Uh, gear release. That was... Uh, okay, we'll go with that. Okay, then. That gave me a heart attack. Everything around here works. This good, solid radio system, uh, ADF system. Really good. The radio's down here. It's UHF. I think we can use it in VHF band, in DCS, because, you know, we need it in VHF band. I stand to be corrected. It's a long time since I studied this. Uh, I can't even remember what this is. Oh, the IFF. So it's all turnable, but not actually modelled because the DCS engine simply doesn't model IFF to that degree. Uh, ah, finally something. That, oh, yeah. No, it's there. Look. Circuit breakers. Look. Found something that doesn't work, but that, that, and that doesn't work, whatever it is. So it's pretty good there, you can say that's 98%, 99% complete. Everything feels good. I know that, like we said, the graphics aren't great, but in terms of detail, I can't really fault it. So for a rating, I don't feel like I can give it a 5. And I can't really justify that quantifiably. It just doesn't feel 5 worthy in terms of interactiveness and detail. But I'm going to give it a solid 4. This just feels like a solid 4 aircraft all the way through, to be honest. It's not amazing. It doesn't blow your, doesn't blow your face off. But it is good and solid. So, interactivity detail, I'm going to rate that 4 as well. So, next we have to talk about the difficulty. It's, I mean, it's quite a difficult one to, to measure. This aircraft is easy to fly. It's not the easiest to fly. But it's a, just a good, stable platform of an aircraft and once you've just mastered the basics of how to fly it it's very rarely will bite you in the arse it's a pretty decent stable aircraft it has good flight model like i said plenty of warning or when you're going to g out and whatnot so it's it's hard to fail in those terms it does have some transonic historical transonic problems obviously you go too fast you will lose control of the uh, ailerons through to uh, you know air compressibility math air compressibility and whatnot got a video on that by the way but generally speaking it's a pleasure and relatively if you keep it in the envelope it's easy to fly I'm actually mastering the systems in terms of mastering MPC in terms of mastering labs and really being able to use these systems in terms of just mastering getting bombs on target and rockets on target and guns on target is actually not that easy it does require plenty of practice and training now the manual for this is pretty simple it's like 150 pages may sound a lot but for a DCS manual that is tiny it was a good relatively easy to follow enjoyable manual to read plenty of support out there in terms of tutorials including Grim Reapers so I think I'm gonna bung it in the middle I'm gonna put it three out of five in terms of difficult it's just it's in the middle it's not as easy as an F-15 it's not as difficult as a Harrier or a, you know a Hornet or whatever it's just somewhere in the middle I'd say so that's the three Next we have to look at its history, and some aircraft have had a very difficult history. The way DCS works is the engine behind DCS is constantly developed, and that means that as things change, bugs occur in planes, and they get fixed relatively easily, and but because of that, some of the aircraft have had a bad history, some have had a good history. Now, to my knowledge, in the last um, what, three and a half years this has been out, there's been very few bugs with it. I can't actually remember a single bug, Now I'm sure that's not true. Uh, I'm sure there's been some out there and you guys let me know and I'll post it to the top of the YouTube video. But I legitimately can't remember when anything didn't work, to be honest. And so as a history, in terms of reliability, to what you put your money into, uh, seems pretty top-notch to me. Let me know if you think I'm wrong on that. So, as a summary, good plane, enjoyable to fly, sound engine's good, the graphics in the cockpit are now dated, but the exterior models still holding up pretty decent. The weapons are limited but obviously period accurate. The weapon systems require a lot of practice. But again, 
superior accurate. Don't buy this. Expect to go and fly with Harriers and Hornets and stuff and compete with them. You can't, obviously. And as long as you understand that when you buy it, I think you've, it's a really top module. I hope that was useful, and I'll see you later.